It is good to have you with us in this season of the resurrection where we continue to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is our prayer that this service of worship where we come together before Holy Scripture, where we share the great music of the church, where we engage in prayer both in praise and thanksgiving as well as intercession for others might be a time of the richest of blessings for you and that you might feel the hand of, of the risen Savior upon you and that you might know grace, you might know peace, but most of all, that you might experience the incredible love of Jesus Christ our Lord. Christ Jesus is alive today. Let us sing praise to the one who has conquered death. His resurrection gives us life. Exalt the Lord on high. Let us exalt the name of the risen Lord up from the grave. Christ Jesus is alive today. Let us sing praise to the one who has conquered death. His resurrection is us. i 
sin was upon him, he bore it all on the tree. Surely he carried our sorrow for our iniquity. Seated now with the Father, ruling at his right hand. The tomb now is empty and our Lord is alive. Praises unto the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb of God who was slain to receive. The Gospel according to St. John, reading in the 20th chapter, beginning at verse 19 and concluding at verse 29. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Here ends the reading of the Gospel. Thanks be to God. Renew
with us, Lord, his zeal abating, while harvest fields are vast and ripe. Revive us, Lord, the world is waiting. Equip your church. central to our time of worship, a time of, of coming before God's grace, God's throne, offering up our prayers of thanksgiving and praise, especially in this season, season where we celebrate the resurrection. But it's also a time to come where we bring the cares and concerns of, of the people of God's world those people who are hurting, those people who are disenfranchised, those people who are left alone, who are mourning, those who are struggling to understand God's grace in their life, praying that, that God would intercede in all of the ways in which they struggle. Let us now be in prayer. Hanging on your every word Words of life for yours alone Leaving all the world behind Waiting here before your throne Speak, Lord Speak, Lord Let your mighty will Come and drown out every other noise Speak, Lord Speak, Lord All we want to hear is your voice We are listening We are listening It's the light unto our pathway It's the lamp that guides our feet We live for every word that you say Speak, Lord Speak, Lord Let your mighty wind Come and drown out every other noise Speak, Lord, speak, Lord All we want to hear is your voice We are listening We are listening 
Let your mighty whisper come and drown out every other noise. Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. All we want to hear is your voice. Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. Let your mighty whisper come and drown out every other noise speak and loving God who has sent forth your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, to die and to rise again. We come with absolute amazement of all that you have done and all that you do to provide for us the gift of love, the gift of new life, the gift of salvation, the gift of transformation. So we come praising you today, but we also come seeking to learn to discover how to walk more closely with you and how to understand more deeply the power of your son's gift of new life to us in his death and resurrection. And so in these moments together, teach us and guide us that we might emerge as people with a greater desire to serve you through Christ our Lord. Amen. The post-resurrection narratives in all four of the Gospels are very similar, but yet have very distinctive characteristics and very unique ways of telling the story. They are both alike and they are different. Matthew, for instance, tells this story in a very elaborate kind of way, even dramatic. For Matthew, when the women come to the tomb, they discover that there was an angel that had descended in the midst of an earthquake, settled on the stone that blocked the tomb, rolled the stone away and sat on the stone, and the soldiers that were sent to guard the tomb were still there, but they fainted, they passed out as though they were dead. It is a moment of, of absolute amazement and absolute terror and really very high drama. After the women had fled, the soldiers came back to life. Uh, they run to the temple elders, explain to them what they had done. And in that moment, they also were given a bribe uh, to uh, tell a different kind of story. Their story as concocted by the Jewish leaders was that in the middle of the night, while the soldiers were asleep, they stole the body. And it is thought that that story continued for generations. And so Matthew's telling of this story is 
characterized in very dramatic and incredible kind of ways. Mark, whose ending to his gospel is one of great debate. There's kind of two endings to that gospel. One that ends at about uh, the eighth uh, verse of the 16th chapter, which basically says that Jesus died on the cross and rose again. Doesn't elaborate much in that early version of what had happened in Jesus' post-resurrection experiences. But it seems that there's a second ending to the Gospel of, of Mark, and most of your translations will note that, that it has always been a matter of some debate, a matter of a bit of confusion, where verses 9 down through 16 paint a, a, a bit of an extended story, a, a moment where uh, the uh, resurrected Jesus does appear uh, to some men walking on the road in the countryside. Luke talks about that as the road to Emmaus. Also that Jesus appeared to some women and yet the, the disciples didn't believe them. That Jesus also had come and appeared to the disciples themselves behind closed doors. And so Mark has his own unique kind of spin in terms of how that story is told. Luke, Luke has a unique way of telling the story, and Luke, as he always does, has great deference for the women who surrounded Jesus, and he gives them a place of honor because they are the ones, you know, who come to the tomb. But the powerful part of Jesus' post-resurrection experiences in Luke is for the disciples on the road to Emmaus these two disciples who we are not sure of their names are, are getting out of town uh, probably because of, of concern about what has happened among Jewish elders and Jewish leaders. Uh, it is quite probable that they saw themselves being at risk. It is quite clear that, that they were trying to get some distance between themselves and, and the Holy City. And as they walked along talking about what had happened, and, and we can imagine in that conversation uh, times of, of disappointment, times of amazement, times of curiosity, and in the midst of that walk and talk, Jesus, unknown to them, greets them and walks along beside them. And as Luke tells the story, Jesus then begins to interpret for them all of the wonderful kind of things that the scriptures had said about this moment and how this moment had become the reality of fulfillment of that which had been written in the Old Testament, especially in the prophets and in the book of the Psalms. And it is that particular story. And then later on, Luke describes that Jesus appeared to the disciples behind locked doors, and there he commissions them. But I want us to focus on John, the gospel writer John, who has a very unique and specific kind of way of talking about the post-resurrection Jesus. It is in that 20th chapter where the disciples are behind closed doors. Now, it, it seems that the disciples here was probably a larger group, not just the intimate 11, minus Judas, of course. It, it was a group of disciples who were present and who were those who had followed Jesus so intently and so present with him. And they were behind locked doors because of their fear of the Jews. And so, as that particular phrase suggests to us, this was a bit of time of, of terror and uncertainty for followers of Jesus. That they, they did not know what was going to be happening to them. Uh, they saw themselves at risk. 
And, and the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all kind of reflect that in different kind of ways. John is very specific. He says they're there behind locked doors because of their fear of the Jewish leadership. And in that moment, Jesus appears to them. Now, there's two great themes in this text that I have put before you today. One of those is the appearance of Jesus to the disciples behind locked doors and his providing for them the gift of the Spirit. The other one is a story that you know so well is Doubting Thomas. And we'll get to Thomas a bit. But I want you to pay attention to those early verses where Jesus enters into their presence behind locked doors, and there he says, first of all, peace be with you, which is kind of a normal greeting. Not, nothing profoundly unusual about that. But after the disciples got over their, their shock and all and wonder at what was happening in this moment, Jesus says to them again, and this is a powerful part of this Gospel of John, when Jesus says to them again, peace I give to you, he says it a second time. And then he breathes on them and says, I give you the Holy Spirit. There's a powerful moment here where the resurrected Jesus appears to the disciples and he breathes on them and gives them the gift of the Spirit very rem reminiscent of the book of Genesis in the second chapter in the seventh verse where God has created humanity, where God has formed him out of the dust of the ground. And as the writer of Genesis says, and he breathed into their nostrils the breath of life and they became a human being. It was not until such time that God breathed into them. God gave his spirit into them. God breathed life into them that they fully became human, fully became alive to what it is that God had created in the world. And now later on, in this moment of Jesus appearing to the disciples, he's breathing on them again, giving them the breath of life. It almost sounds like we were never fully human until God breathes life into us. And we're never fully alive until Jesus breathes the Spirit into us. That's the message that we get from John. It is this breathing of power and grace. Now, following this, there are some verses which are difficult. They are any sins that you are, will forgive will be forgiven, but any sins that you retain will also be retained. But a tro troubling passage for scholars for generations upon generations. But I think what is behind that is the power that God has breathed into this people. God has breathed into us an energy, a power, a capacity to become agents of God in the world. And so we have become fully alive, fully filled with God's grace. That passage is so rich because it talks about this post-resurrected Jesus who not only rose from the dead, who won victory over life and death, but it is also this Jesus who breathes power into this people, these disciples, and breathes power into us. Now, let's pay some attention to this doubting Thomas, because it is wrapped around the whole idea of belief. For the ancient church, it was so important to, to have faith, to believe in what it is that God had done, what God is doing. And to realize that, that God had been so active, and this great story that we have of Doubting Thomas 
is so illustrative of a particular moment with one of the disciples who just did not have that faith, did not have that capacity to believe that God was going to fulfill all that he had done. But as you know the story, Jesus appears to Thomas and says to him very clearly, hey, put your finger in, in my nail holes, put, put your hand in my side, believe. But then that great line, blessed are you, those who believe but have not seen. And so we come to this text understanding that God has given us his son in new life. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus, we have been resurrected. We have been made whole. But then for John, the second step is to breathe life into us, to empower us to be agents of God in the midst of the world. But you got to believe. you got to have faith. You got to understand that everything that Jesus said, he's done. Everything that Jesus promised, he accomplished. Everything that Jesus came to do, he made happen. And so we come to this text understanding from John's point of view that this post-resurrected Jesus who came into life in fullness and power also gave power to this people, for this people who will believe in him. And so know this day, my friends, that God has breathed life into you, did that at creation, did that at your birth. But in this Easter event, he has breathed new life into you. He's breathed energy into you, he's breathed power into you, he's breathed his capacity for people to be representatives of God's grace in the midst of the world. And so, for those who believe, who will accept all that God has done in Jesus Christ, then I would say to you that the grace of God is powerful and sends us out into the world as new creations, new creations that can transform the world in the name of the risen Christ. He's breathed life into us. Let's believe that. And let's go into the world and breathe life into a broken world. Amen.
has been a blessing to have you with us today. It is our hope that, that the scriptures that have been read and, and proclaimed might surround you and bring you closer and closer to the risen Christ. It, it is our hope that the prayers that we have shared might, might have brought you to closer to the presence of God, that healing presence, that, that presence of praise and thanksgiving. May it be a time when the music of the church has stirred your soul and brought you closer and closer to moments of praise and thanksgiving and adoration for all that God has done. And so now in the name of God, who has breathed life into us, in the name of the Son who has died and rose again for us, in the name of the Holy Spirit that breathes life into us, may you go from this place, this moment, giving thanks and praise to God and experiencing God's grace and blessing in all that you do. Amen. All to Jesus, I surrender. All to Jesus, I surrender. Surrender all to Him.